Hello and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be doing our September governor's election prediction ahead of this fall's midterm election. So we'll be taking a look at all of these states that are non-safe states on this map and be ranking them as either going in favor of the Democrat or the Republican. No toss-ups in this prediction and obviously the states that are filled out are already safe states that either party will win by 12 points or more and there's really no situation in which these states are going to flip to the opposite party. Now, we've only got 50 days until the midterm election, so in some ways that's really coming up fast, and it really is, but at the same time, it could still be a political lifetime, and some things in this video may end up changing come November, and that's why we're going to be doing this series monthly. We'll do another prediction again in October, and then, of course, a final one in November. So we're going to start off from West Coast to East Coast and make our way across the country, but before we do, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing down below and liking this video if you enjoy so anyway, we're going to start off with the state of Oregon. Oregon has a very interesting dynamic this cycle because there are three top candidates running for the governorship. You have Tina Kotek, who is the Speaker of the Oregon State House, Christine Drazen, who is the Republican nominee, and then you have Betsy Johnson, a former Democratic state senator turned independent. Now, a Republican has not been elected in the state of Oregon since 1982, so it's been 40 years since the last time Oregon elected a GOP governor. And that's quite a long time. That's a lot longer than other states that we normally think of as bluer than Oregon today. States such as California, Oregon, Illinois, Maryland, uh, Massachusetts, Vermont. All of these states have had, Hawaii even, all of these states have had Republican governors more recently than the state of Oregon. Now, if we take a look at the polling for this race, it's really all over the place, but essentially the polling tells us there's a neck and neck race between Tina Kotek and Christine Drazen, mainly because Betsy Johnson is in the race and she seems to be taking equally from both candidates. Based on the numbers, the fact that Oregon is a more democratic state, it looks like she's taking more from Tina Kotek, but still she's basically put both of these contenders at a very level playing field. And as a result, the Republican Governors Association has put a lot of money and ads into this race because they see it as a potential flip from blue to red. Now, ultimately, Christine Drazen seems to be leading in the polls very narrowly. Of course, we don't have an overall aggregate and it does get confusing with the undecided and of course, Betsy Johnson in the race. But Tina Kotek has a lot to prove because she is ultimately going to be tied to the Brown administration, which is extremely unpopular in the state of Oregon. Kate Brown is one of the most unpopular governors in the country for a variety of reasons. And, you know, Christine Drazen is campaigning as a moderate Republican. She's not exactly as moderate as somebody like uh, Phil Scott or Charlie Baker, but she seems to be more like a Glenn Youngkin or even Larry Hogan type Republican where she's not really talking much about social issues. She's focusing on the economic kitchen table issues and focusing on crime, which is a huge issue in the state of Oregon, especially in the Portland metro area. So overall, given this sort of vote split that we're seeing right now, given the fact that I think Drazen is running a good campaign, I think she has a narrow edge in this race. I'm going to put this in the tilt Republican category, which is not a categorization I've had for Oregon in a while. And again, as we go throughout this video, you're going to see that some states uh, are really going to surprise you, I think, in the way that they're ranked because... Uh, it's not going to be a clear and cut picture in terms of the trends of the country. Some states are going to trend more blue and some states are going to trend more red, mainly because governor's elections tend to be less nationalized than Senate and House elections. So ultimately, I think Christine Drazen probably wins in Oregon by about a point, point and a half at this rate. Again, it looks like Betsy Johnson is currently taking more from Tina Kotek, but all of these polls are within the margin of error. Uh, but I do give Drazen the slight edge based on the national environment and based on the fact that Kate Brown is incredibly unpopular and Tina Kotek, uh, I don't think, is doing enough to distance herself from the unpopular incumbent governor. Moving on down to the state of Nevada, Steve Sisolak, the incumbent Democratic governor, is currently polling slightly ahead of his Republican challenger, uh, Joe Lombardo, depending on which aggregate you look at. Of course, RCP actually has Lombardo up by 1.4%. 538 has Sisolak up by 1.9. The overall average has Sisolak up very slightly at just 0.2%. So this really is anybody's race in the state of Nevada. Now, if we take a look at some of the recent polls, we have Lombardo up by 2, up by 2, Sisolak up by 3, and a dead heat according to Emerson College. And I think ultimately, 
national trends will play a role in this race specifically because Nevada is such a close state nationally and ultimately it does have a Senate race that is of significant consequence at the top of the ballot. And ultimately, whatever party ends up winning that race is likely to win this one. And I think as of right now, given the fact that Laxalt is a strong candidate on the Senate level, Lombardo, I think, is a very good candidate for Nevada. He's the sheriff of Clark County, the most populous county in Nevada. Also the bluest county. If he can win there, I think he could certainly win in Nevada statewide, even against an incumbent. Steve Sisolak isn't incredibly popular either. His approval ratings are somewhat mediocre, and I think ultimately the national environment will drag him down. Nevada is a state that's been trending consistently more Republican since 2008. Uh, it actually trended red from 2016 to 2020 very slightly, and that trend was led in the Clark County area. And I think ultimately Lombardo being from Clark County, I think he could possibly get 46 46.5% uh, of the vote here. I think he can take it over the top. So I think Lombardo probably wins this race by about two percentage points against incumbent Governor Steve Sisolak. Moving on down to the state of Arizona. Now, this is a race that earlier on, I would have said Carrie Lake was a weak candidate. She had very fringe views for the state of Arizona, especially since Arizona is more of a moderate conservative state. But as of late, uh, the dynamics in this race have changed quite a bit, mainly because of the Democratic nominee, Katie Hobbs, who I think has not been running a particularly good campaign. Taking a look at the polling aggregate right now, Lake is up by one point in the RCP average. I tend to like RCP a bit better than 538. 538's numbers are very skewed, uh, especially in favor of Democrats because they take fundraising into account, which in some cases is valid, and I think in other cases it's not. Uh, so it does paint a very different picture, but uh, Kerry Lake has exceeded all expectations uh, from my point of view, I think Carrie Lake was somebody who I didn't think would be this strong in the general election, especially given how pro-Trump and ultra-conservative she is for a state that rejected Trump back in 2020. But given the fact that 2022 is expected to be a year where we have somewhat of a snapback, Republicans are still likely to win the generic ballot by about a point or so. Uh, I certainly think something like that could carry her over the top. And Katie Hobbs won't even debate Carrie Lake, which I think is very poor optic. I think Katie Hobbs could have ran a much better campaign. Again, Carrie Lake has some very unpopular and even fringe positions in terms of a broader general electorate. I don't think Katie Hobbs has effectively communicated that in a strong way. And I ultimately don't think uh, she's a good fit for the state of Arizona. So ultimately, I think Carrie Lake probably wins this race. I also think this is going to be about a two-point margin, very similar to Nevada. Again, of course, we're 50 days away. It could change. Carrie Lake could do better. Katie Hobbs could do better. But as of right now, uh, September 19th, that's the way I see it going. I think Carrie Lake wins by about two points, 50 to 48. Moving on over to the state of New Mexico. Now, again, this map is going to be pretty interesting because uh, the trends are not all going to be uh, equal. You know, some states, again, like I said, are going to trend more Republican than others, and some are going to trend more Democratic than others. And some might be a bit surprising, especially as we go uh, further east. But taking a look at New Mexico, I think Mark Ronchetti is an incredibly good fit for the state of New Mexico. And you'll notice for some reason, uh, the Southwest tends to like to nominate TV news anchors. Uh, Ronchetti is a weatherman, and Carrie Lake, of course, was a news anchor for a very long time in the Phoenix area. But this is a race where I think the Republicans have real potential because the incumbent governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, is not popular. And not only that, she's not exactly running the best campaign. She has a number of scandals, uh, sexual assault scandals that I think will end up hurting her in the general election. And I think Mark Ronchetti actually knows the state he's running in. He's not running this, you know, extremely uh, right wing campaign in a state that ultimately is a state that voted for Joe Biden by 10.8%. Now, he's somebody that I think can make this race extremely competitive, and I actually think he has a slight edge in this race because of the fact that Joe Biden is not popular in this state and because of the fact Michelle Lujan Grisham is not popular. Again, unlike other Republicans like Tudor Dixon, Doug Mastriano, uh, Mark Ronchetti has not been putting his stake in very unpopular positions uh, in New Mexico. He's actually been running, in my opinion, an excellent campaign. He's been focused on the bread and butter issues. He's been talking about crime, the economy, uh, energy, which is huge in the state of New Mexico. And I think ultimately he has an extremely slight edge in this race. And I've put this as tilt Republican before. Uh, I think Mark Ronchetti could win this by about a point or so. So I'm going to put this as tilt Republican because I think this race could be very close. Again, Mark Ronchetti, this is the same candidate that overperformed Trump by over four percentage points back in 2020. Donald Trump got 43.5% of the vote here in 2020. Mark Ronchetti got 45.6. Ben Ray Lujan 
got 51.7. Of course, Joe Biden got 54.3. So he overperformed Trump pretty significantly in these more urban, suburban counties, which I think are going to be key to him actually winning statewide. Now, I don't think somebody like Ron Ketty is going to win Brunello County this time around. I'd be extremely shocked if that happens. But I expect him to make it a lot closer, similar to what Glenn Youngkin did in the northern Virginia suburbs, you know, Fairfax, Loudoun, and Prince William. I think Ron Ketty can make these counties a lot closer and ultimately uh, swing the race in his favor by, you know, galvanizing a coalition of rural uh, MAGA Trump voters while also winning over suburban voters that are disaffected with the Biden administration and the economy as it currently stands. So that's the reason why I give him a very slight edge in this race, and I think the national environment is certainly going to help him as well. Moving on up to the state of Colorado. Now, Colorado is a lot different than New Mexico, especially nowadays politically. Uh, Colorado used to vote consistently to the right of New Mexico uh, you know, throughout national election history, and 2020 saw a break in that cycle. Colorado, for the first time in decades, voted to the left of New Mexico. Again, New Mexico voted for Joe Biden by 10.8%. Colorado voted for Joe Biden by 13.5%, which is a safe margin. That's a huge gain over Hillary Clinton's 4.9% margin in the state just four years earlier. And you saw massive shifts throughout suburban Denver, which ultimately carried Joe Biden in the state by such a convincing margin. Now, ultimately, Jared Polis, the incumbent governor, is running here again for re-election. He's running against Heidi Ganahl, who is the Republican nominee, who's also part of the Board of Regents in Colorado. She's the only statewide Republican left in the state of Colorado. And then she's also running against a Constitution candidate, which right off the bat, I think, hurts the Republicans. We've seen this happen in a number of races in Colorado. It happened, some argue it was a spoiler in 2010 between Ken Buck and Michael Bennett. Some people say the Constitution candidate played spoiler there. Uh, a couple of other races, too, with John Hickenlooper as well. So having a very right-wing third-party candidate, I think, only hurts the Republican Party. Now, if we take a look at the rankings for this governor's race, we have Safe D, Likely D, Lean D. Uh, the polling, the latest poll that we have, which is a Republican firm, has Jared Polis up by 7. Trafalgar has him up by 5. Uh, some polls have him up by a crazy amount. Uh, but ultimately, I've been consistent. I think he wins by a likely margin. I think Jared Polis wins by about eight to nine points. Again, I think he's a bit hurt by the national environment, but overall, he's an incredibly popular governor. I think he's going to get a lot of crossover votes. You're going to see people voting for Joe O'Day uh, in the Denver suburbs and also voting for uh, Jared Polis, although I'm not saying in this video that Joe O'Day is going to win. I just say that O'Day is probably going to outperform Heidi Ganahl, which I think is a pretty safe bet. Uh, and ultimately, there's going to be some split ticket voting in the state of Colorado. Jared Polis is going to do better than Michael Bennett, uh, just purely based off his popularity in the state and the fact that many view him as a very good governor. Moving on down to the state of Texas. Now, I previously ranked Texas as safe, which is, again, 12 points or more. But the polls have tightened a little bit, uh, especially in the last couple of weeks. Currently, Greg Abbott, the incumbent Republican governor who... Uh, I should mention is not as popular as he was in 2018. In 2018, Greg Abbott won a pretty resounding victory over Lupe Valdez. He won by 13.3%, despite the fact that Beto O'Rourke only lost the Senate race by less than three percentage points on the exact same ballot. So Greg Abbott got a ton of crossover support from independents and even Democrats. And I think uh, in the last four years, he's become a much polarizing figure. I think the uh, energy crisis that happened in the beginning of 2021 uh, a number of other issues, obviously the Uvalde school shooting, uh, things like that have really turned a lot of suburbanites against him, although it's still not enough to make this race extremely competitive. The polling average has him up by about seven. Abbott's challenger, Better O'Rourke, is a very progressive Democrat, very left-wing Democrat, but he shouldn't be underestimated in his ability to turn out Democrats, specifically young Democrats in the urban metros around Texas. I mean, if you look at some of the margins, that Lupe Valdez got in these urban counties, and you take a look at the margins that Beto got in those exact same counties on the exact same ballot, there's a huge difference. Lupe Valdez massively underperforms because she didn't really campaign very much, wasn't well known, and Greg Abbott was incredibly popular. His approval rating was plus 20, plus 25 throughout the entire state. This time around, Greg Abbott, I, I believe, is either slightly above water or slightly below water, uh, depending on which poll you look at. But ultimately, that's certainly not something that's going to help him. 
Uh, obviously, I think Beto O'Rourke has done some things since 2018 that would turn him off to some moderates. Greg Abbott is still leading among independents. Uh, I think he wins this race, but I think he wins by about 10 points. Again, I could be wrong. It could be closer. It could be a little bit more uh, in favor of Abbott. But at this point in time, I think he probably wins by 10 points. I think that's a very safe bet as of right now. Moving on up to the state of Kansas. I made a video on Kansas uh, a couple months back stating that I thought Laura Kelly was going to lose her re-election, and I stand by that. We have one poll that came out of Texas that I think was a little ridiculous, which I believe had Laura Kelly up by, uh, you know, 12 points. I don't think that's going to happen. Echelon Insights never really has good polling, so I wouldn't really take any uh, real serious look at this, especially given the fact that they've been extremely wrong in a number of races. But the polls besides Echelon show a pretty close race. You have a three-point advantage for Kelly, three-point in favor of Schmidt, three-point in favor of Schmidt, four-point in favor of Schmidt. Ultimately, I think the polling and the results will break in Schmidt's favor given the national environment. I think Laura Kelly will, and she is, you know, hammering him on the issue of abortion. She has a decent amount of Republican support as well, uh, mostly, if you'll note, by former uh, Republican uh, representatives and statewide officials, not really any current but I think as of right now, Schmidt still wins. I think he wins by a likely margin. I used to say about 10 points. I think it's going to be about six or seven. I think it'll be closer. Uh, you know, abortion has become an extremely hot button issue. And even in a state like Kansas, which is extremely red, is not exactly the most socially conservative state either. And Laura Kelly is a popular incumbent. So, you know, I previously said she was going to lose by 10. We had a different national environment, different uh, circumstances at that time. I've since kind of moved it a bit more in favor of the Democrats. Moving on up to Minnesota, you have, of course, incumbent Governor Tim Walz going up against Scott Jensen, the Republican nominee. Uh, you know, so far, based on the polling, Walz is the clear favorite. Uh, see, this is what I mean again by 538. 538 has Walz up by 10. RCP has him up by 3.5. Um, I guess it's because 538 takes these survey monkey polls, which I think really aren't very reliable at all, and puts them into their aggregate. I don't think that creates a clear picture of this race. The overall average, if you take a look at the RCP and 538 aggregated together, it's wall 6.7. Uh, you know, Scott Jensen is somebody who I think uh, earlier on had some potential. He was trying to run more of the Yunkin strategy focus on the kitchen table issues while still energizing the rural sort of MAGA vote in rural Minnesota. But Tim Walls is not somebody who's unpopular. In fact, uh, he's actually fairly popular in the state of Minnesota, uh, despite what some Republicans would want to believe. And I think ultimately uh, he will hold on this cycle. I think he probably wins by about five or six points, uh, you know, just around in the lean margin, not exactly likely. I don't think he'll go over six points, but I think about five and a half points is a pretty comfortable margin. Again, I think Scott Jensen is uh, a fairly decent candidate, but Minnesota is still a blue state. Tim Walls, I think, is a pretty strong incumbent, and I don't really think there's a lot of anti-Walls energy to kick him out of office. And Minnesota is a state that tends to be immune to these sort of red and blue waves uh, to an extent. I mean, the blue wave hit pretty hard in 2018, but if we take a look at some of the down ballot races... Uh, in Minnesota. Again, Tim Walls won by over 11 points back in 2018. But if we look at the down ballot races, uh, you know, Attorney General Keith Ellison only won by about four points, less than four points, 3.9%. So this is a race that I think will be a lot more competitive than the governorship. And you could see some split ticketing here because you could see a Republican uh, knock off Keith Ellison. Because if you take a look at the polling for that race, and we're not going to cover it in this video because we're going to focus on the uh, governor's elections, but it's essentially neck and neck despite the governorship being a lot more lopsided in favor of Walls. So if anyone was going to go down on the Democratic side of Minnesota, I think it would be Keith Ellison, not Tim Walls. Moving over east to the state of Wisconsin, we have, of course, incumbent Democratic Governor Tony Evers against Republican challenger Tim Michaels. Interestingly enough, Tim Michaels actually ran against Russ Feingold back in 2004. He actually lost by around 11 points. Uh, pretty convincing defeat, but he's come back uh, nearly 20 years later to run for statewide office again. And according to the polls, uh, Evers does have a slight lead, but in every single average, he's up by about two points or so. Now, Johnson is actually up in some of the polls in the Senate race, and I think Johnson will overperform Tim Michaels. Now, looking at Wisconsin back in the 2020 election, it was the third closest state in the country. Joe Biden only won Wisconsin by 0.6%. That's a more narrow margin than Donald Trump's victory in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, and I think that certainly hurts Evers. I think another thing that hurts Evers 
is the fact that there are Republican supermajorities, or at least Republican majorities, in both chambers of the state legislature that basically stall any legislation he wants to get through. So he really doesn't have a whole lot of accomplishments to put to his name, besides the fact that he can make the argument that he's the only person stopping uh, you know, abortion bans in Wisconsin, these other things. And these are ads that he's been running throughout the state. But Tim Michaels actually does have a decent amount of funding. He's been fighting back in these ads. Uh, he's proven to be a pretty formidable candidate. Uh, in my last videos, I think I had Michaels up. I still think Michaels probably beats Evers. I think it'll be by a margin of about two points. So I think he'll underperform Johnson by a couple of points. Tony Evers is an incumbent. Wisconsin does like its incumbents. I mean, we could just take a look at 2018, for instance. Scott Walker barely lost to Tony Evers. I don't think Tony Evers is the strongest candidate. I think Michaels hitting Evers on crime and the increase in the state, I think will be very effective, especially in the wow counties. And what's really interesting to note is that... Walker did better in the WOW counties than Donald Trump did back in 2016 when he won the state overall. And I think the WOW counties are going to be a strong area for both Michaels and Johnson this time around. And I think in both cases, it's going to put both nominees over the top. Moving on over to Michigan. Now, uh, so far, the gubernatorial map has looked very good for Republicans. But I think this is where the tide turns a little bit. Gretchen Whitmer is a popular, well-funded Democratic incumbent. And despite what a lot of Republicans would like to believe, um, beating her is incredibly difficult. And I think the Democrats have a huge advantage in this race. Tudor Dixon, the Republican nominee, I don't think is a good fit for Michigan. The main issue of this campaign is really boiled down to the issue of abortion. And Tudor Dixon's view on abortion is extremely unpopular in the state. And she believes in uh, basically banning abortion with no exceptions. And that's the only thing that Gretchen Whitmer has been running in her ads constantly. And Tudor Dixon has no counter narrative because she can't run ads because she has virtually no funding. I think I read an article a week or so ago, which had Tudor Dixon's total earnings at about $50,000 cash on hand, uh, which is absolutely pathetic. You know, most congressional candidates raise, you know, 10 times that much, if not more in competitive races. Tudor Dixon does not have a viable fundraising apparatus. I think, again, she's a bad cultural fit for Michigan. The Michigan GOP, I think, really dropped the ball in this state. And I ultimately, at this point, I don't think uh, that's really going to change. I think Tudor Dixon probably loses by about five points. So that's going to be a hold for the Democrats in the state of Michigan. And five points might seem like a lot. But again, Tudor Dixon has no counter to this narrative. And there are Republicans that are very angry with her about lockdowns and other positions. But ultimately, I think she's going to outperform in the suburbs. I think she's going to win places like Kent County, similar to Joe Biden. She's going to win Genesee County, these other areas that uh, typically were closer in past elections for Republicans. But I think she's going to have an outsized performance. And I don't really see Tudor Dixon doing better in the rural. She might do uh, only slightly worse than Donald Trump, but I still don't think that's going to be anything close to enough of what she'll need to actually flip this seat. So it's a really tall order. I think Gretchen Whitmer right now has a pretty big advantage. And again, if we look at the polls, uh, depending on what average you look at, plus eight, plus 11, plus nine, um, I think the national environment is gonna make it so Republicans overperform those a little bit. But Tudor Dixon is still going to lose by about five points or so. I think it's gonna be around a 51-46 type race in Michigan. Moving on up to the state of Maine, uh, you have a former governor running against a current governor in this state. You have Paul LePage, the former Republican two-term governor, going up against the incumbent Democratic governor, Janet Mills. Currently, the polling in this race gives Janet Mills the advantage. She's up by about 3.5%. The latest poll has her up by five points over former governor Paul LePage. Ultimately, I think Mills does have the advantage here. She probably ends up winning by a lean margin. Now that's different from my July prediction, but again, a lot has changed since then. The national environment has moved a lot more towards the center. You know, back in July, we were thinking of an R plus four environment. Now it looks like it's gonna be anywhere from a D plus two to an R plus two environment. I think anywhere in that range is pretty fair. And I think ultimately Janet Mills uh, will benefit from that as of right now. Moving on down to Connecticut, this was a state that back in 2018 actually almost flipped to the Republicans, mainly because former Democratic Governor uh, Dan Malloy was so incredibly unpopular. But Ned Lamont was able to hold on. I think part of the reason for that was the blue wave. But Bob Stefanowski performed exceptionally well uh, in a year where Republicans were doing very poorly around the entire country. Uh, he got 46.2% of the vote. He only lost this race by 3.2%. 
Uh, but this time around, the circumstances have changed. Now, you'd think a redder national environment would help Stefanowski, but Ned Lamont is the incumbent, and he's actually fairly popular. He doesn't have the problem that Dan Malloy had, uh, which was one of the reasons why his two elections uh, you know, were very close in a blue state like Connecticut. If we take a look at the polling average, Lamont is up by about nine points. Uh, from what I've heard on the ground, Stefanowski hasn't really been running the same campaign he was running in 2018. He's really sort of taken a back seat. Uh, this time around, and I think ultimately that's going to hurt him. Uh, I think Lamont probably wins by a likely margin. I could see it being anywhere from 8 to 10 as of right now. Moving over to the Keystone State, Democratic Attorney General Josh Shapiro and Republican State Senator Doug Mastriano is probably going to be uh, one of the most consequential governor's races of this cycle because it has a lot of implications on the 2024 election because the governor actually gets to appoint the secretary of state and Pennsylvania has very lenient laws when it comes to mail-in voting and early voting and things like that. And that could very well change if Mastriano is to win. Uh, obviously, if Shapiro wins, he'll probably keep the current system, if not expand it even further, depending on which secretary of state he appoints. So it does have 2024 national implications. And if we take a look at the polling for this race so far, Josh Shapiro has the lead right now. He's currently up anywhere from 5.4% to 10.4%. Now, what makes this race so interesting is the fact that the polling is as close as it is, despite the fact that Doug Mastriano has virtually no money. Again, he has the same problem that Tudor Dixon does. And you'll notice this with the further right candidates. They tend to do very poorly in fundraising, partly because a lot of people don't think they can actually win their respective races. Tudor Dixon in particular uh, is doing much worse on that front than Doug Mastriano. But Doug Mastriano has only raised or has a half million dollars cash on hand where Josh Shapiro has, I think, like $44 million. He's got an insane war chest. He's blasting the airwaves with all of Doug Mastriano's very unpopular uh, far right positions. And ultimately, I think it's really going to hurt him in the Philadelphia collar counties. And this area, by the way, is such an important area politically because Republicans have to stop the bleeding in these counties in order to win statewide. They have to do well in the rural areas, exceptionally well in the rural areas, and then just hold their own in the suburbs in order to win. And I think because Josh Shapiro's narrative is going unchecked, uh, Mastriano has no counter narrative at all. And some of the things are very uh, damning in some of the ads, you know, related to the Capitol and things like that. Uh, Doug Mastriano's position on the election. Those are things that terrify independent voters in the suburbs in places like Chester County, which Donald Trump lost by over 17 points. Some of the down ballot candidates only lost Chester by about single digits. So there is a lot of split ticket voting that happens in Pennsylvania, especially in the collar counties, which I think are going to be so crucial to this election. Now, you know, some of the polls, the recent polls, Trafalgar has Mastriano down by two. But all the other polls have Doug trailing Shapiro by larger amounts. You have the Emerson College poll that has him down by three, one poll that has him down by 12, etc., etc. So, so far, Josh Shapiro has a commanding lead so far in the polling average overall. Again, Doug Mastriano has virtually no money. He's got a lot of baggage as a candidate. Uh, he's not putting himself on the airwaves. Josh Shapiro is. Josh Shapiro is portraying himself as a moderate. I think that plays very well in the suburbs. And ultimately, at this point... I think Josh Shapiro is the favorite in Pennsylvania. I think he probably wins by about three percentage points. Now, that's very different from my previous prediction in July, but again, a lot has changed since then. Doug Mastriano has failed to really get any significant fundraising. And while he does have Donald Trump's endorsement, there are a lot of moderate and independent voters you have to win in Pennsylvania to win statewide, especially in the Philadelphia uh, collar counties, which are much more moderate and not exactly a pro-Trump area of the state. And even if Doug Mastriano overperforms in these rural areas, if he does worse than Donald Trump in the Philly suburbs, it doesn't mean anything he still loses. And Josh Shapiro has an incredibly strong performance in various counties throughout the state, not even so much in the Philadelphia area, although I think he'll do better in the Philly area this time around. But Luzerne County, for instance, this is a county that Donald Trump won by a safe margin Joe Biden only got 42.3% of the vote in. And yet, if we take a look at the attorney general results from the 2020 election, Luzerne County not only is a close county, but actually goes in favor of Josh Shapiro, giving him a plurality of the vote. Again, this is an ancestral Democratic county. And I think he also had a strong performance here back in 2016. He narrowly lost the county 
back in 2016. I think he only lost it by less than a point if we take a look at the results there. Yeah, he lost it by less than a percentage point. So for whatever reason, uh, Josh Shapiro is very popular here in Luzerne County. And this is a big area for Republicans. I mean, Donald Trump has won this by a safe margin both times he ran for president, both in 2020 and 2016. Obviously, he did better in 2016. But I think this time around, Josh Shapiro is just an incredibly uh, well-funded candidate. And it's hard to argue that he's not a formidable candidate especially this cycle, given the fact that he's running against Doug Mastriano and not some other generic Republican uh, that actually has money and doesn't have the same baggage as Mastriano does. Moving on down to the state of Georgia, this is a state that I think will be a lot better for the GOP uh, than some of the Rust Belt states. Again, as we're looking at the map so far, the GOP is losing Pennsylvania, they're losing Michigan, they're obviously losing Minnesota. So the Rust Belt overall hasn't really been good for them. They've gotten a pickup in Wisconsin. I still expect that to be the case. But down in the state of Georgia, which is a state that's rapidly trending in favor of the Democrats, Brian Kemp is leading in the polling aggregate by 5.5% overall. And he's beating Stacey Abrams, the same person he versed back in 2018 that he only beat by 1.4%. So you're seeing a shift from the right if current trends continue from 2018 to 2022. Now, ultimately, I think there's a number of reasons for this. One, I think Brian Kemp actually has a record to run on now. Um, he's proven to be a much better candidate for the suburbs than a lot of people thought he would be back in 2018 when he barely won again. He did historically bad in Gwinnett and Cobb counties. These are the worst margins for a Republican in decades in Georgia. You probably have to go back, uh, you know, back to when Georgia was a solid blue state to see these sort of margins in Atlanta suburbs. But ultimately, Kemp, I think, is a strong candidate this time around. He's been able to cobble up a unique coalition because he did have that falling out with Donald Trump. He's never said anything really against Donald Trump. The only thing he stated is that the 2020 election was fair, that he couldn't overturn it. And essentially that got him in the good graces with a lot of suburban moderates who probably voted for Biden back in the 2020 election, but might vote for Kemp in the 2022 election because of the stance he took. And I expect Brad Raffensperger, the secretary of state, to do exceptionally well in Georgia down ballot. So ultimately, Brian Kemp is a very strong candidate. The polling has him up by about five. Georgia polling is usually very accurate. So I would think that he probably wins by around this margin. Now, I think uh, he's not going to win places like Gwinnett and Cobb County, but I think he'll get a lot closer. I think the margins here might be surprising. I think he can get easily, I think he can easily get about 44, 45% in Gwinnett, maybe like 46% in Cobb. And I could see Raffensperger outright winning in those counties. Stacey Abrams had her moment, I think, in 2018. She missed her window. This was the blue wave year that uh, she really should have won in. 2022 was not a smart year to run in, especially with Joe Biden being the president and being unpopular. Ultimately, really ends up hurting her at the end of the day. Finally, we go down to the state of Florida, the state of Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis versus Charlie Crist. Uh, this is a race that has had some pretty terrible polling, in my opinion. Uh, DeSantis is up in the average by about four points or so. I think he's going to do a lot better than that. You have a lot of polls that I think, quite frankly, are very unrealistic. You have Chris leading, which I don't think would happen in the state of Florida, especially given the fact that Ron DeSantis is a very popular governor, and Florida is a state that has lurched to the right uh, in recent years, especially in Miami-Dade County and southeastern Florida as a whole. You saw trends to the right. Miami-Dade, a 22-point shift to the right. That's one of the reasons why Donald Trump not only won Florida, but did a lot better uh, by Florida standards than he did back in 2016 when he only won the state of Florida by a little bit over a percentage point. And he lost Miami-Dade County by nearly 30 percentage points. So this time around, I think uh, Ron DeSantis is a strong incumbent. I think Charlie Crist is a weak nominee. He's known statewide, but I think he's made a number of missteps. He's hired uh, as his, or he's taken up as his lieutenant governor. Uh, nominee, somebody who is very unpopular with the Cuban community. She's been known as a Castro sympathizer. Um, also a leader of the teachers union, which I think is also very controversial in Florida, especially since Ron DeSantis uh, has been relatively good on education. I think ultimately DeSantis probably wins by a likely margin. Uh, I see him probably winning by about eight points, 53 to 45 at the end of the day. Again, you're not going to see a crazy landslide because it is Florida. But DeSantis is popular and he's polling very well. And, you know, the polls, I think, are overestimating Charlie Crist, especially because you have a lot of these Democrat and Republican polls that tend to favor Democrats overall. Uh, I think the other results where you have DeSantis up by five, six, seven are a lot more realistic uh, at the end of the day. 
So that puts our gubernatorial map at 31 seats for the Republicans, 19 for the Democrats. Again, we have 50 days until the midterm, so this could obviously change, but this is the way I see it as of right now. Obviously, comment your thoughts down below. Tell me what you agree with, what you disagree with. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're new and you've made it this far. Like this video down below if you've enjoyed. And as always, again, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.